This week, Starbase has been preparing for the future. Ship 28 has possibly gotten a full engine change, we've seen systems testing at the launch site, a new blast wall going up for more protection, and an amazing post by SpaceX from inside Mega Bay 1. Oh, and a hint on when we might get approval for Flight 3. This is your Starbase Update, sponsored by Star Trek Fleet Command. We're kicking off the week with this tank, which SpaceX removed from the suborbital tank farm and transported to Massey's. This appears to be a water tank since it was placed near the vapor rises next to the methane section of the new tank farm at Massey's. With it being water, it will probably be used for the heat exchanges in the tank farm. SpaceX is still working hard on getting the new possible flame trench and static fire stand at Massey's completed, which, as you may be aware by now, will increase the capacity at the launch site for flight activities compared to testing activities for the ships. Other than that, Massey's is still waiting on Ship 31 and Booster 13 for cryo testing, which is still months away. Moving over to the Rocket Garden, from right to left we have Booster 4, Ship 28 on the engine stand, Ship 26, Ship 32, and Ship 20. Ship 28 is currently getting more work ahead of Flight 3, with workers working on it around the clock. A surprise to everyone was that SpaceX started to swap out engines on Ship 28. Here you can see a Raptor Center that is being prepped for installation onto the ship. Since we can't see the serial number, we don't know exactly which engine it is. Along with a center engine being swapped, we can see here that Raptor Vacuum 235 has been removed as well. Now, it is unclear why SpaceX is doing this. It could be because of the mitigations they are trying to resolve as a result of the Flight 2 mishap investigation, or it could be that some damage was found and they decided to swap them out. However, if that were the case, why didn't they do it after Ship 28 just rolled back? Another possibility is that SpaceX wants to install upgraded engines whilst they have the chance. There's no point in flying an outdated design if a new design is ready to go. Now with possibly six Raptors being swapped, the question becomes, will SpaceX perform another static fire? Based on their history with Starship, yes, there's a good chance they will, which could push any launch readiness back a week or two. But there is always the chance that they don't do a static fire, which would be pretty impressive assuming the engines work as planned after stage separation during Flight 3. Do you think they'd skip a static fire just to save a week or two? Let us know in the comments. Alongside the engine swaps, even more tile work is going on, specifically on the flaps. SpaceX seems pretty confident Ship 28 will make it to re-entry, and they really want to give it the best shot possible if it does. To add to everything else being worked on with Ship 28, teams have reinstalled three out of the four of the Starlink antennas on the nose cone. We don't know why they removed them in the first place, but it's not like all of the other work on Ship 28 has been totally logical either. Now with Ship 28 on the engine install stand for the time being, the two-point lifter stand was moved back to its home next to the high bay. Moving on to everyone's least favourite ship, Ship 26 is getting stringer couplers installed. These connect the rows of stringers together and make it even stronger. And again, we still don't know what Ship 26 is supposed to be used for. We're probably looking at a beefed up test tank, but I know there are a bunch of you who are holding out hope that this is some kind of orbital depot or HLS test bed. It would be hard to talk about Sanchez and not mention the new tower being built, but this week the news isn't at Sanchez, but at the Turning Basin next to the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center. SpaceX has moved tower sections 1, 2, 3 and 6 to the Turning Basin, with only sections 4 and 5 remaining at Roberts Road. Most likely, SpaceX plans to transport at least two at a time to the port of Brownsville on a barge. Once all of the sections are in Texas, they'll either close Highway 4 for one mammoth transport attempt with all of the segments rolling down the road at the same time, or they'll break it up with rolling only a couple of sections at a time over multiple closures. Now, it will be a couple of weeks before they complete their crossing of the Gulf, so we do have to be patient. Make sure to follow Gav over on Twitter because I'm sure he'll be keeping a close eye on the positioning of the barge or barges that carry these segments. Next, we'll be taking a look at the pesky new door on Mega Bay 1, but first I'll hand it over to Sawyer for a word from our sponsor. You know I love the Space Shuttle Endeavour, but there's another vehicle that I love. Enterprise. And no, not just the Space Shuttle vehicle currently located in New York, 
I'm talking about the USS Enterprise from Star Trek. Now I can fly it and play as some of my favorite characters with the help of today's sponsor, Star Trek Fleet Command. Fleet Command is a free MMO that lets you customize your fleet and crew to dominate the galaxy. I love how much there is to explore in this open world. I mean, we're talking all the way from the Alpha to the Omega Quadrants. It includes iconic characters from the original series, TNG, J.J. Abrams films, Discovery, and more. And of course, the ships. Besides Enterprise, you can build the Romulan Warbird and the Klingon Bird of Prey. Join millions of players where you can either be friend or foe in your journey across the galaxy. And there's new content each month. This month you get new Enterprise officers Trip Tucker and T'Pol, plus 10 new Enterprise themed missions and 10 new side missions. You can play on desktop and mobile by scanning the QR code that you see on the screen right now. If you need to pause it, go right ahead. Otherwise, it's also in the link in the description below. Then for new players, you can link your Scopely account, head to the website, and on the promo codes page, enter Warp Speed for a free new player content pack. Just remember, you have to be a new player and do so before level 10. Thanks again to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. Now let's live long and prosper back to our video. As we talked about last week, SpaceX had finally begun to install a door on Mega Bay 1. This week, they installed two out of what looks to be three sections that will cover the entire height of the doorway. Here you can see them test the first two sections by bringing the door up from fully extended. Now, as mentioned before, this is suboptimal for us tank watchers that like to see everything going on inside all of the bays at all times. However, this is a great thing for the Starship program that will help increase overall reliability and cleanliness as the program shoots for orbit. And don't forget about the workers, I can't imagine how nice it will be to have a climate controlled high bay to work in during the Texas summer. And that wasn't a figure of speech. As a very pale skinned Brit, I literally do not have the mental capacity to imagine those conditions. Speaking of making the program more reliable, we have more work on the Star Factory. Here we can see SpaceX and its contractors keep chugging along in building this rocket factory. We can see from Mary's aerial photos, they are already pouring concrete into footings that go all the way back to the first Star Factory section. Alongside that, we can also see that the section currently under construction is now being connected up to the pre-existing taller construction section. You can even see that the opening allowing passage between both sections has been covered in some temporary material. This long and tall section will probably be a manufacturing line for nose cones. As they approach the high bay, they get progressively completed before leaving the factory to be assembled with the other ship components. SpaceX may even install the payload section inside of the factory to reduce the number of welds needed to stack each Starship inside Mega Bay 2. This would allow them to finish more off the heat shield inside of the factory rather than inside of a high bay. Speaking of Mega Bay 2, the roof is nearly complete as SpaceX wraps up the construction of the new bay. We are still waiting on the next ship work stand and its work platform to come over from Sanchez. Once this stand is in and installed, Ship 30 will likely take that spot for engine install. For the ship that is currently inside Mega Bay 2, Ship 29 has been getting engines and we know that because a Raptor Center engine was spotted going into the bay. Ship 29 could be ready for a static fire test shortly after Flight 3. SpaceX is full steam ahead with the next several launches with work going on inside Ship 31's LOX tank. Its other half, Booster 13, is still in two big pieces, but that's not much of a surprise considering how crowded Mega Bay 1 currently is. Speaking of Booster 13 and the other boosters, on Friday SpaceX posted some images on the platform previously known as Twitter showcasing the inside of Mega Bay 1. From this first image, you can see four boosters getting ready for flight. From left to right, we have Booster 13's liquid oxygen tank on the left turntable, Booster 10 on the left work stand, Booster 12 on the center work stand, Booster 11 on the right work stand, and Booster 13's liquid methane tank on the right turntable. But there's even more to pick apart in these images. Starting off with Booster 10, here we can see that there is some scaffolding up around the methane tank hatch, which could mean that SpaceX either had some final checkouts to perform inside, or they were doing some final modifications. We can also see that SpaceX is working on the composite overwrapped pressure vessels, or COPVs, under the chines in the back. 
Currently, we don't know when Booster 10 is slated to roll back to the launch site for a possible wet dress rehearsal, but as you'll see later, SpaceX is hard at work to make that happen sooner rather than later. Moving to Flight 4's booster, B11 has been on the right work stand for about two and a half months at this point, and if you look closely, it appears to already have its outer engine shielding installed. And just as with booster 10, booster 11 has scaffolding going to the methane tank hatch, as well as having pieces of its chines removed. We can't see the LOX hatch from these pictures as those are on the side facing away from the cameras. Booster 11 could be ready for a static fire any day now if it isn't already. After Flight 3, it will be interesting to see how quickly Booster 11 rolls to the pad. Booster 12 returned from its Massey's holiday a few weeks ago and it's currently residing on the center work stand. The angles aren't the greatest, but there may already be engines installed on this booster as SpaceX is getting ahead with vehicle production. That means, at a minimum, there are 66 Raptor engines inside of this high bay alone, with a good chance that there's even more. Last but not least is Booster 13, which, as we said earlier, is still split in two. In the first image, you can see the mounting locations for the carbon dioxide tanks and for some of the tank pressurization lines that go up from the engine section to the tops of each tank. Then, in the final picture, you can see that Booster 13's LOX tank was rotated, so the quick disconnect, which is out of frame, is pointed at the camera. This rotation allows us to see that both CO2 tanks are installed and more pressurization lines were added. Looking at Booster 13's methane tank, you can see that the grid fins are yet to be added, but some of the raceway has been installed. The day after this post, Booster 13 was fully stacked on the left turntable, which makes four fully stacked boosters in Mega Bay 1. And there's actually more interesting things to point out other than the four most powerful boosters of all time. The middle stand is farther back than the other two, allowing clearance when the grid fins are installed. If they were all in a line, the boosters would get in each other's way. We can see the work platforms that are under the boosters are partially lifted for booster 10 and 11. These help to raise the engines and shielding up so workers no longer have to use scissor lifts. There is also the platform that connects all three booster stands together so you can just walk back and forth between each booster stand. Looking up the back wall of Mega Bay 1, we can see the custom cranes that were built to help work and install pieces of the chines as well as the COPVs that go in the back of those chines. There are catwalks that link the custom work platforms built to allow access to the boosters, and it also allows SpaceX to build scaffolding across to gain access to other areas. At the top of the bay, we can see the two 180 metric ton bridge cranes that allow SpaceX to lift and stack each booster. And in the final picture, we can see the first section of the new door being installed. Hopefully now that the new door is being installed, SpaceX will share more images from inside of the bay, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Whilst we move over to the launch site, let's not get distracted by this meteor that was caught on Starbase Live. SpaceX has relocated a tank from within the suborbital tank farm to the location where they took the tank for masses from. SpaceX doesn't need as much capacity in the suborbital tank farm anymore since they no longer perform full cryogenic proof tests on the suborbital pads. They only static fire, which requires less propellant. Finally, after a few weeks of some heavy maintenance, the LR11000 crane appears to be fully assembled and ready for use once again. If SpaceX decides they want to do another static fire with Ship 28 as mentioned earlier, they would need the LR11000 to be ready so they can lift the ship onto suborbital pad B. And speaking of the LR11000, the squid that is normally used on the crane for lifting ships has left the launch site for probably the final time as the ships these days get their crane lift points removed and tiled over before going to cryo. This means that only the two-point lifter, the lifting rig that emulates the chopstick lift points, should be used outside of the bays from now on. Not counting Ship 26, of course, but let's be honest, no one cares about Ship 26. As mentioned last week, SpaceX has been quickly building a new concrete wall to protect the liquid oxygen subcoolers and communication bunker of the orbital tank farm. This week, they finished bringing in the sections and started to lay down rebar and a wood form so that they could pour a slab of concrete on the backside of the new wall to hold it in place. This wall is in a U-shape, which should help reflect the shock waves from 33 Raptor engines away from the sensitive equipment in the tank farm and in the communication bunker. This is a nice improvement from the simple sand barriers that existed here before that didn't protect much since they didn't go very high. However, sand is a better shock absorber than concrete, so we'll just have to wait and see how this new wall holds up. 
Looking at the orbital launch mount, work continues as SpaceX has been working around the clock to get this pad ready for Booster 10's return, which is hopefully soon, TM. This week, many systems were tested and the chopsticks were opened to launch position, but they did not move vertically. Then a full booster QD and ship QD real-time retraction test was performed. After this testing, SpaceX apparently needed to replace the actuator on the booster QD hood, and after this, they performed a couple more retraction tests. All of this testing is a great sign that we may be very close to booster rollout and a launch, hopefully within the next month or so. We've gotten even more news that the launch might not be that far away as well, as the Washington Post's Christian Davenport posted that the FAA is on pace to issue a modified Starship launch license sometime in mid to late February. As always, there could be delays, like if Ship 28 would need another static fire, it could add a week or two to the preparation timeline. But most of the available information we have at this moment points to a launch around three to four weeks away. A great video to watch and re-watch if you've seen it already is DASA's deep dive into how we determine potential launch dates from what the FAA tells us to temporary flight restrictions, notices to mariners, road closures and much more. Thanks again to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. To play on desktop and mobile, head to the link below. New players can also head to the website and enter promo code warp speed for a free new player content pack. I'm Ryan Caton for NSF, thanks for watching and goodbye.